Ted Naricott needs a plow horse. That's why he's at the auction now, and his friends are trying to remind him of that. The problem is, he's just set eyes on a very cool horse that is completely wrong for that kind of work. Barely able to afford the one he needed, it would be very wise to forget about this one. Of course he does the exact opposite, and not just because he likes the cute one. He also has a bidding rival he wants to spite. The man standing right across him is Lyons, Ted's rich landlord, who has an eye on the same young horse. Now is it a good idea to pick a fight with your landlord like that, especially if the man can afford to bid much higher? Apparently, Ted thinks so. Or maybe it's the booze doing the thinking for him. Anyway, he beats Lyons and comes home with a useless horse and more impoverished than he left. While his son Albert is over the moon with the new pet, his wife Rosie is totally furious. She asks how he's gonna train that thing with his bad leg, and Albie says he'll do it. The boy is a horse-loving dreamer like his dad, much to Rosie's despair, but he has zero experience in training them. Rosie watches that sad spectacle with mixed feelings of tenderness and anger. Albie's friend Andrew is much more of a tough crowd, laughing at his face when something goes wrong. Albie takes offense when he compares Joey to a dog. Yes, he named the horse Joey, and he talks to Joey very slowly in plain English to make sure he's understood. He also tells Andrew that he read in a story that the Native Americans summoned their horses whistling like an owl. He tries that with Joey, and it actually works. Over the next few days, that horse almost knocks down everyone in the farm every time the boy whistles. One day, Lyons comes by to collect his money. That visit is a lesson on how to be a proper villain. You see, Lyons is not a villain because he wants his money. It's because he doesn't. He is delighted to hear that Ted doesn't have it. It's the perfect opportunity to humiliate him in front of his family and threaten to take the farm away. Ted says he can grow turnips in the bottom field as soon as Joey is ready to plow. Lyons agrees to wait until October. If that plan fails, Ted's gonna lose both Joey and the farm. Albie begs him to reconsider such a tight deadline, but Lyons maintains the dignified evil posture at least until the door. When he gets outside, a surprise goose attack kind of makes him lose his cool for a moment there. Freshly infused with vengeful determination, Ted is now ready. Ready for a kick in the face, that is. Channeling his anger anywhere but his own drunk self, he picks up the shotgun, saying that it's pointless to keep feeding the useless beast. Rosie stops him, stating the obvious. If he shoots the horse, they have even less than they had before. His son promises to train the horse until October, somehow. So here's Albie with another eloquent speech. I think by now Joey actually understands him, but chooses to pretend he's just a horse. Even the goose shows up at the door in case Joey needs some muscle. And off they go to the bottom field where Ted Naricott swears he can grow enough turnips to pay off his debt. Yeah, it doesn't look like he'll be turnip king anytime soon. Even Ted's friend is telling Andrew that the whole thing is a lost cause. Not even a sturdy horse could perform such a miracle on its own. Lyon shows up too with his son David. He sits right next to Ted and says Albie is a fool to insist on the impossible. Stupidity must run in the family. After all, Ted left a thriving farm to his brothers in the firm belief that he could make something out of this piece of trash. But then he got that leg injury and started to drink because of the pain. The rest is history. Such a shame that he is also bringing his wife and son down with him. Albie begs Joey to move and nothing happens. He decides to use the whip then. Now Joey runs too fast and down goes Albie with his face in the dirt. His pathetic efforts are so amusing that a bunch of people gather to watch and Lyons won't shut up a minute. He tells him to call it a day and give up. That's already more work than his father got done his whole life. That's when a heavy rain starts driving the audience away. Albie tests the muddy ground with his foot, and it seems like it could be easier this way. So he finally begins to make it work. Most of the haters are already leaving, but Rosie and Andrew are still there, watching proudly. Lyons comes back too, not too pleased with that glimmer of hope. 
He tells Rosie it's a shame that a mother would let her child in the mud like that, so close to a plow blade and all. That boy could lose a foot or something. Now that's it. With the knitting needles to illustrate her point, she says maybe he is the one who'll lose an eye if he doesn't shut up about her family. That is probably the one thing that could make Ted smile today. And nothing can stop Albie now. He is a lean, mean plowing machine. When the field is done, the boy is in much worse shape than the horse. His mom looks after him and takes the opportunity to talk about his dad. She says it's easy to judge him, but the booze is not just for the bad leg. He's seen all kinds of awful stuff during the Boer War. So much so that he threw away his Distinguished Conduct Medal. Rosie had to retrieve that and his campaign pennant. She says Ted could take pride in fighting with honor, but she refuses to be proud of killing. That makes him an even braver man. Seeing his dad in a different light now, Albie decides to borrow the pennant as a souvenir. Time goes by and the turnips are coming. David Lyons is telling a pretty girl that she is very lucky to be in his dad's car, one of the few in the village. However, she seems more impressed that Albie's horse can keep up with the vehicle. David gets annoyed at that, but not for long. At the point where Joey is supposed to jump, he decides Albie can do it instead. During a storm, two very important things happen. The first one is that we learn the goose's name is Harold. The other thing is that the turnips are ruined. Once again in a pickle, Ted tells Rosie that he knows her love can only take so much. She guarantees that she will never love him less, but might hate him a lot more. Weirdly, it makes sense. Then, something really big happens. World War I. Not knowing much about what's going on, Albie is shocked to see the stable empty. Ted has taken Joey to be sold to the British soldiers. It's too late when Albie catches up with him. He's already shaken hands with Captain Nichols, but the captain is not a bad guy. He says Joey will be his own mount and he'll do everything he can to return him to Albie. There's nothing the boy can really do but say goodbye. He's kind enough to adorn the horse with Ted's pennant, so we can tell which one is Joey now. So our hero has a new home at the British base. Major Stewart has a remarkable black horse named Topthorn. While Nichols and Stewart tease each other about which animal is superior, Joey and Topthorn ignore that childish rivalry and become BFS. Nichols starts writing a letter to Albie. He wants to let him know that the horse is okay. Major Stewart ruins his mood by saying Joey is all right for now because they haven't left yet. But they soon do. It's 1914 now, and the British are fighting the Germans in France. Relying on the surprise factor, Major Stewart plans an attack on a division that is twice their size. The strategy does work at first. Everyone at the German camp panics to see them coming, and it looks like the British really have the upper hand. Until they hear the awful sound of firearms. It's too late when they realize they have brought swords into a gunfight. With much more advanced weaponry, the tables are turned very fast. Several British soldiers lose their lives, including Captain Nichols. Major Stewart is forced to surrender. The captured horses that have no use at the moment are to be put down. A young soldier named Gunther says they can pull the ambulance wagon. His brother Michael says these horses are from the cavalry and they won't take the harness. That's when Joey goes, did someone say harness? The two boys are amazed at his versatility. Gunther says whoever taught him to do that has just saved his life. Topthorn does not have the same impressive background but he goes along with his buddy as the two brothers drive the ambulance wagon. Back at Turnip Land, Andrew's dad brings a parcel to Albie. It's Captain Nichols' sketchbook and that makes the boy super happy until he sees there's a letter too. It's from Seat Perkins, and it says Captain Nichols left Albie this stuff before he died in action. Michael is assigned to the front line while his brother stays behind, since he's so good with horses. Gunther begs him not to go, but Michael says their dad wanted this, and he's also proud to serve. Gunther does his best to understand and accept that, but he just can't bear the thought of losing his little brother. So he makes a risky move. Taking both horses with him, 
He snatches Michael away from the German column. The two boys then hide in a windmill nearby. Michael is upset that they have deserted and says their father will be ashamed. Gunther knows that's all true, so he starts to change the subject. The boys begin to plan their future in Italy, where Gunther says the food is better than the women. In the middle of the night, the boys are sound asleep when the German soldiers arrive. The officer asks Gunther if he made a mistake. He says he made a promise. Both boys are put before a firing squad and executed. The next morning, Emily and Grandpa are having breakfast. But wait a moment. Who the hell is Emily? Oh, these are the people who live in that farm with the windmill. Emily's parents are missing and Grandpa keeps trying to pretend there is no war around them. When she says that two horses have appeared in their windmill, he thinks that's also a fantasy at first. Joey and Topforn are now renamed Francois and Claude. And now Grandpa is seriously worried, and not just about her talent to pick names. Emily has a bone disease that makes any falls or bumps really dangerous. Grandpa says he'll die before he lets her ride a horse. His loving granddaughter replies that it won't be too long then. So now our heroes are in some kind of equine exchange program, getting top-notch training from this little girl who's barely seen a horse before. She tries to teach Joey to jump, but he keeps disrupting the lesson. When she is about to make a riskier move and Grandpa is ready to let her have it, they hear the soldiers coming. The horses must be hidden quickly or they'll be taken away. Grandpa asks a soldier what's going on, and he's told that they need food for the soldiers at the front. Everyone must give their share. This surprise visit means that Joey and Topforn get a slumber party tonight. Once those people are gone, Emily reminds Grandpa that her birthday is tomorrow. As a gift, she asks for the truth about her missing parents. But Grandpa is not ready to talk about that. Instead, he gives her an actual present. The saddle he had hidden all these years, so she would not get any ideas. Ready for the adventure, Emily takes off Joey's pennant and gives it to Grandpa while she's riding. He tells her to stay close, but she is soon out of sight and taking way too long to return. When Topforn rushes in the same direction, Grandpa knows there's something wrong. The soldiers are still here. They need horses to pull artillery, and now there's no way around it. Both Joey and Topforn are taken away. They are put under the care of Heigelman, a man who looks tough and scary, but turns out to be adorably fond of horses. He tries to spare them and avoid cruelty as much as he can, but the reality of these animals is terrible anyway. Our poor boys end up spending the entire war pulling incredible weight. By 1918, both Albie and Andrew have enlisted, and they're also in France. It's the Battle of the Somme and Andrew is instructed to take down any fellow soldier who returns to the trenches out of fear. He can't bring himself to do that. So he decides to cross no man's land and surprisingly makes it to the other side, where Aldi already is. But that's when a gas bomb goes off. Yeah, whatever. Where are the protagonists? Oh, here they are. Both Joey and Topforn have miraculously survived all these years of horrid work. But poor Toppy has reached his limit now, and he dies of exhaustion. Heigelman and Joey mourn him while they can. The British are coming and Heigelman is dragged away from his beloved horses. Heigelman refuses to leave Joey, but gets dragged by his mates because the British are coming. Joey finally breaks free and crosses the battlefield like a mythical beast. His crusade comes to an end when he gets horribly tangled in barbed wire. From the British trench, the soldiers see there's a horse caught in the wire. A soldier named Colin takes a white flag to approach the animal. The Germans think it's a trap, but they're also too curious to see what this crazy guy will do. When he gets to Joey, there's little he can do with bare hands, but luckily there's a crazy guy on the German side as well. A soldier named Peter lends him a wire cutter, and they start working together to free the poor horse. When he's free again, they toss a coin to decide who gets to keep him. That's a win for England. Colin takes Joey to a doctor and begs for a few minutes of his time. Not too far from them is Albi, temporarily blinded by the gas bomb. He hears about the miracle horse everyone is talking about. 
But the doctor is telling Colin that Joey's wounds are way too serious. The horse must be put out of his misery. Just when a surgeon is about to pull the trigger, an owl-like call is heard, slowly making his way across the injured soldiers and nurses. Albie keeps repeating the call he once taught his beloved horse. Joey has not forgotten. Facing suspicion about the far-fetched story, Albie describes Joey to prove it's the same horse. Colin helps to clean the mud out of the paws and the white diamond-shaped mark. The doctor apologizes to Albie and promises to treat Joey like the soldier he is. And so he does. But when the war is over, Albie is shocked to learn that only officers' forces will be sent back to England. All the others must be auctioned. Many soldiers have grown fond of this crazy pair by now. So they all pitch in and Colin hands Albie 29 pounds for him to buy Joey back. Even David Lyons, of all people, is willing to help send Joey home by saying it's his horse. Because of course David Lyons is an officer. So it's all set up for a happy ending now, right? Wrong. Emily's grandpa shows up at the auction offering 100 pounds and says he's ready to sell the farm to make it a thousand if necessary. Albie and Colin try to appeal to Grandpa's kind heart with their sad story. He then tells them about Emily and says she died recently. Taking care of Joey is all he can do for her now. Once again, Albie has to see his horse go away. But as Grandpa is leaving, Joey comes back to Albie. Watching their sad goodbyes, Grandpa begins to have second thoughts. He takes the pennant out of his pocket and asks Albie about it. He says it belongs to his father. Grandpa can see the emotion in his eyes and is forced to admit that Emily would want what's best for the horse. Joey obviously prefers Albie. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2011 movie War Horse by Touchstone Pictures, starring Jeremy Irvine and Emily Watson. So what part of the story do you think was the most interesting? And which character did you like best? Let us know in the comments below with hashtag cinema recap. Until next time.